Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are waiting for a few more participants to come in. Please be aware as you log in that we do have participants microphones and cameras turned off to minimize distractions during the presentation. But if you take note of the chat option bar at the bottom of the screen, you can enter any questions that you have during the presentation into that chat bar and we will address questions at the end of our presentation. All right. Well, we may still have people joining us, but we will go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Prophet, and I'm the Education and Communication Specialist with the Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. And presenting with us today is Justin Reinhardt from the Ohio EPA, Cindy Meyer with Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. She's our Conservation Program Specialist. And we're also joined today by Molly Conley, who is our Director at the Soil and Water Conservation District. We're very happy that you guys are all joining us today, and we're going to get started today with Justin. Justin, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you, Melissa. And welcome, everyone, to my basement, as we are currently telecommuting at Ohio EPA and have been through this uh, COVID-19 situation. So today, we're going to jump into some discussion about rain gardens, and as our initial literature flyer or announcements discussed. Rain gardens are a, a, a very cool tool for treating storm water, especially in smaller areas. And there's a lot of material we could probably spend a day or maybe perhaps even a week talking about the different particulars of it. And unfortunately, we don't have that long. So I'm going to try and briefly run through a little bit of background and introduction and then some design guidance instruction uh, instruction did i just say that instruction uh, and thoughts that will hopefully get your head turning as you look to maybe constructing something similar and uh be aware be uh, take comfort that there are many many resources out there besides what we'll discuss today that can aid you in the uh, final project so let's back up just a minute and look at why we would be doing this, what rain gardens are all about, and how we got to where we are to begin with. And that starts by understanding the effects of urbanization that happens uh, on the natural hydrologic cycle. And that's a cycle that essentially moves water from precipitation through the soil into groundwater, off the surface into our streams and rivers, and then back up into the atmosphere through the various uh, processes of evaporation, transpiration, infiltration, et cetera. And you can see this real common graphic on the left shows you that in a natural setting, undisturbed forest prairie area, the amount of rainfall that ends up turning into runoff on the surface is very little, 10%. The rest of it is going other places, mostly because of the soil and vegetation, vegetative cover. And as we remove that cover and replace it with impervious surface from a low density development all the way to your uh, ultra urban inner city areas that are nearly to 100% impervious, that amount of runoff increases drastically. And you can see that that effect really happens at 10% and above. So not just an inner city or urbanized area, but rural areas also start to impact uh, profoundly the, the, the surface waters and, and groundwaters. And so why is this a problem? Well, it, there's a couple of uh, things to think about. First, that stormwater runoff carries with it the pollutants that it, it encounters on the landscape. So that might be uh, inadvertent pollutants such as oils and metals and things that would leak onto a road from cars. You can see the sheen on the left uh, in the, on the curb, uh, spills like on the bottom, exposed chemicals, uh, pollutants of any sort that rainfall is going to wash off uh, into the rivers and streams. So the more urbanized area we have, the more runoff, the more pronounced that effect becomes. 
And this is a problem because that stormwater doesn't receive any treatment like your sanitary systems and waste, other wastewaters, including some industrial process waters, would receive through a treatment plant and various treatment mechanisms, chlorine and loculation and settling and those type of biological treatments. All of those, all that runoff generally gets piped directly into a storm sewer system, uh, road ditch system, or straight into our channels, creeks, and tributaries. And that's why you see on the lower picture a lot of communities and municipalities have taken to efforts to make people aware of that, like the, the drains to lake stencils and, and signs to make people aware, hey, this, this grate may look like it goes to nowhere, but it goes right to the, the stream or river and everything going down it also does. The other element to that is the increase in runoff produces an increase in volume of water and the rate that water is flowing off of the land, which rapidly exceeds the capacity of streams and our, our natural drainage system and creates flooding issues uh, and, and erosion issues, which can be very detrimental to us and the people downstream of us. So I just want to emphasize that erosion is a really a natural process that occurs all the time everywhere. It's to an extent unavoidable, but when it becomes exasperated by these increased flows, that's when we start to see problems. You can see in the upper left, a somewhat natural wooded area with a very small channel, very, remember, very small amount of runoff that channels percolate or uh, trickling through there. And it's maybe eroding a little bit, but it's very small. We develop that area, the channel needs to increase. That process usually starts with a downward movement and increasing in stream size, as you can see in the bottom picture. The banks start collapsing, and that may or may not be a problem depending upon how close you are living or working to that stream bank or even things like farming next to that stream bank. Okay, so the thing to remember there is flow, flow that, that water flowing through that channel is essentially energy. And that energy can erode and causes that erosion. But that erosion works to bring a stream into what we call dynamic equilibrium, meaning that it would not be eroding anymore. When you think about it, think about the picture on the upper upper uh, left if you're uh, if you're a hiker at all and you know the quickest way down that cliff which looks to be pretty darn steep to me would be straight down but that would not be a lot of fun that would take a lot of effort a lot of danger so what do we do we create these back and forth switchback patterns and ease that slope and create basically a meander it looks very much like a stream on the lower picture you can see the stream bouncing left and right left and right and eroding at those edges where they've hardened it here with some armoring so that increased energy creates erosion, which is the stream healing itself, in a sense, creating the capacity to flow water at a reduced and non-erosive uh, energy point. That would not be a problem anywhere if, uh, again, we were not uh, wanting to keep that stream in one place because it's going to erode, in this case, into the high school football stadium there on the, on the lower picture. So with that said, how does a rain garden come into play? Well, good news, you know, we have tools to work to pre help abate those scenarios from happening, that those flooding and erosion type problems. And rain gardens are one really cool, easy to apply tool. I put the little extra, extra newsboy up there because although at times it may seem like, what's this? This is something new and innovative. Uh, and creative, it, it really actually is not. Uh, the rain gardens and the concept have been in development for about three decades now. And there's probably hundreds of thousands of them throughout the U.S. So this is a, a methodology of science that is still somewhat evolving, but the concept is really something that's not new. It's part of a bigger suite, usually referred to as low impact development, which is essentially trying to look at how can we take stormwater controls and rather than take a, a subdivision of 40 acres and control that whole 40 acres new subdivision in one one and a half acre pond right up front by the road can we break it down and treat each individual residence and each individual impervious area at its source they would say uh, with with the treatment mechanism like a rain garden and divvy that work up and make it much more manageable so a rain garden can do that. Again, I said earlier that it treats 
very small areas, and it does a number of things. It, it provides flow attenuation, again, to reduce that erosive force of, of the, the increased runoff. Pollutant removal mechanisms through, so it's treating that water and the pollutants that might be carried with it. And it also provides a new outlet, which is really the interesting part of, of a rain garden in that we're not just dumping that water straight into the stream or lake or river, but we're allowing that to infiltrate through the soil uh, in back into the groundwater supply. And perhaps much of that does end up returning to the stream through base flow. But it, that's how it really works to attenuate those problems. Okay, so pop quiz, two photos here. Based on your knowledge, and I'm sure some of you have researched uh, or are well aware of rain gardens, which image to you conjures up uh, a, a good representation of a rain garden? The upper one or the lower one? I'll give you a minute to think about that. But we don't have too much longer, so I'll, I'll shorten that down to just a couple seconds. Okay, that may have not been a fair question, so let me change it up a little bit and ask you between these two, which of the two images conjures up a, your vision of a rain garden? And maybe that's a little bit easier to see. Uh, uh, on the bottom, we have Fairly typical traditional uh, lily pad filled wetland with the bird box there. And we have uh, uh, a uh, basically a prairie. This is, oh uh, boy, name slipped my mind up near Bellbrook, I believe, in Dayton. A uh, prairie area, wildflowers. So uh, that's probably what most of you went to when you saw the thought about rain gardens. Obviously, everyone's looking at the plants and, and the landscape benefits. Uh, to, to a rain garden versus the, 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 the tension on the water side. And that's good because that's what we want you to think. A lot of people end up wanting to compare a rain garden to a wetland type scenario. And that's not really the case. I'll point that out by starting by looking at, at, at what's underground or the, the, the soils here. So we have two soil profiles. On the left, you have a, a typical wetland soil profile. So the bottom of a wetland on the right, it was a picture I took of a wooded area, a construction project, uh, cutting into some fairly undisturbed land uh, in, in Madison County. And the, the thing I want to point out is the contrast. If you look at the surface, you can't see too well on the left, but you see a very thick detritus layer and immediately goes to gray, which indicates you've got water sitting. There's no movement. There's no oxygen flowing, so there's no oxidation or rust happening as you see the reddish colors as you move below that. So you've got water sitting. On the right, you see a thick, darker layer above the, the yellowish, heavy clay glacial fill area. So you have a very, and a lot of roots in that. So you have a very deep topsoil layer. You have a lot of good things happening there. The water is able to assimilate and stay in that topsoil and provide, uh, it, it, really be, it really acts like a, a giant sponge to soak up, retain some of that water, let it slowly infiltrate through the clay, let it get up taken up by the plants and trees you see, as opposed to the wetland where that's all sitting on the surface in a pond that ends up being heavily vegetated. So if that was your thoughts that we were building maybe mini wetlands, I, I just wanna move you away from that. And really we're not looking at this as being a pond as much as focusing on what you see on the right. Plants, in this case it's trees and brush, and more importantly, the soil below that. Okay, so that was my quick introduction to just to give you some kind of quick thoughts and about, about rain gardens, what we're doing, what we're trying to do, how they work, why we would do it. If that's interesting to you, the next step is what would I do to build one myself or maybe help neighbors build one or work to uh, with my community to have these installed. So we'll talk a little bit more about the details of, of design. And I want to First day, there's a lot of, like I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of resources. Most of them sort of all fall back, revolve from the same thought process and theory. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time going through real detailed calculations and analysis and how you should be doing things. But really focus on this being a somewhat simple process. The first step of, in, in the journey forward is really starting by just understanding where the water goes within a property. And most often we see these being in a residential scenario. Other times, a lot of rain gardens have been constructed, especially on a, on a demonstration point of uh, standpoint, 
on institutional or municipal or park type facilities. They tend to be smaller buildings, smaller parking lot areas, representative of the same square footage as a, as a residence and, and work very well. Once we move out of this arena into more commercial retail, industrial settings, a strip mall, um, a shopping center or warehouse, our square footage has become much larger and we need to move to a little bit more of a, of a designed process using these same scenarios usually more often referred to as buyer retention. But again, you can see, and I'll point to you, this comes from the bluethumb.org website, which is a very thorough resource and it's been around for a long time on rain gardens. Unfortunately, a lot of it is uh, not freely available, but um, I'd point that out as a very good resource. And you can see what we've done and what they've done in this picture is simply mapped where the water's going, both with looking at roof peaks, looking at the, at the ground, uh, it, itself. There are a lot of resources to help you do this, including Google Earth, one of my favorites. They have the terrain tool, they have a measuring tool that you can use to assess your site a little bit better. County auditors usually have very good maps, GIS, um, online GIS programs that can provide you with up-to-date aerial photography and other information. Of course, there's soil and water districts, and I should have Shouted out on slide one, my apologies, but Warren, so on water. Uh, thank you for, for hosting this, and they will probably be a great resource um, of information to you as you move forward. So, when we look at what we're targeting on that site, think about really you can break it down into three surface covers you have a, a roof area, you have driveways, and parking, and lawns. As you can see on the left, I, I've given you some of the breakdown of how much of that rainfall comes to you as runoff from the different surfaces. Almost everything falling on your roof runs off your downspout gutters and into the sewer system. Most everything from pavement does, and oftentimes very little does from grass. Uh, but it can be up to 20%, depending on the scenario uh, you have as far as ground cover and soil goes. A lot of pollutant loading comes from the roofs and driveways. Oils, metals from cars. Uh, you may have asphalt shingle particles and pieces coming from the roof, uh, spills, other things. Lawns, uh, heavily fertilized lawns uh, may end up exporting nutrients. You just have to be careful there if those also coincide with herbicide use. You don't want to have a, a herbicide that might end up degrading or damaging a rain garden as, as it will. Uh, a lot similar to, to the weeds in your lawn. So how would I do this in reality? Uh, again, I start by assessing your site, looking at it, where's water going? I took an example photo of maybe someone who wants to build a rain garden, assess where your downspots are, what roof portions go to those gutters, where the gutters flow. Uh, in this case, like many uh, suburban areas, those downspouts are piped directly to the curb and then to the sewer system. As you can see, the underground pipes are probably where the dashed lines are. I've scouted out an area here in the blue circle where maybe a rain garden might go. It looks like this person has some landscaping features and maybe a small rain garden could collect one or both of those downspouts uh, on the, the left side of the house. And as I was looking at this photo, uh, one of the things I noticed, and again, on Google Earth, was that it seems awfully dry, yet you see water in the curb of the street. And that indicates to me that there's probably a sump pump discharging here. So that is a situation that we want to be aware of. It's that we're starting to see rain gardens utilized for sump pump discharge waters. But you need to be careful because those operate so much differently than rainfall. There's a lag time. They cycle at a very different rate than rain. Uh, my, my sump pump runs every five minutes in, in March and February and runs every five days maybe in, in July. So that can really alter how a rain garden might affect your plants. I would definitely recommend checking with others uh, who may have done that to, to learn a little bit more before hooking up a sump pump discharge. So again, I use Google Earth. I figured out my roof area here on the front part of the, the, the house is 900 square feet. And you can see I, a little clue here to help you find that tool if you do want to use this uh, Google Earth tool. There's two downspouts, so I could collect from one of those downspouts basically half my roof area, or 900 divided by two or 450 square feet of roof I could collect into a rain garden. That would be great if I could go ahead and do that. 
So that's just a quick example of how you might assess what your drainage area to a rain garden could be. So once you determine kind of what area you want to collect and how big that area is, the next step is to look at the soils you have. And as I mentioned earlier, soils are really the key component to a rain garden. There's probably three things you're going to do, and you're going to start by just a visual assessment. You probably already know this without having to go out and, and look closely, but what are the conditions of the site you're thinking about? Or maybe where on your property is the best location for it? There's a lot of things to consider, including age of the development or uh, the, the, the construction. And on the left, you see very common practice now if, within heavily graded areas. You have heavily compacted soils uh, right underneath a layer of sod. So you can see in this picture this clear distinction of a, of a, of a nice looking sod cover, but right underneath it, much like carpet, is, is simply almost concrete in effect. Heavy clays that are heavily compacted. That are, you can see is not going to drain very well. And you can almost start to see some indication of some runoff flow if you look in between the houses there in that picture. So those are scenarios that aren't going to be very conducive to rain gardens are going to need some help. You can also look at, the, at just the grass cover and, and what, what's the situation here. This is two photos from my house taken pretty much 30 seconds apart of two different areas. And you might question why is one look good and one not look so good? Is it lie wet too often for grass to be maintained? Is it just too dry? Why is it too dry? Maybe it's a sandy soil and it doesn't hold the water. Uh, maybe it's too clay and it doesn't hold the water and it cracks. Maybe it's a shaded area. The grass just doesn't get enough sunlight or the nutrient values are low there. So that may be or that may not be a good area for a rain garden, but those are things that you want to consider when looking at, uh, at what you might need to do. Once you've done that, soil maps are another good resource. Now, soil maps are great because they provide wonderful information, but it is not to the detail of a quarter acre or less or more property. These are done much on a much larger scale and they are cursory, but, and they provide a lot of information, a lot of information. And, and I don't even want to, even, as not being a soil scientist, to pretend to understand half of it. But it can give you an indication through what's called a hydrologic soil group, or just one of the many features in a soil map, of how that area will react to runoff. Okay, so this map here is of the, the, the south uh, western corner of, of Warren County, you see Western Row uh, and Mason area. The, the yellow shaded and, and greenish yellow shaded are, 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 are part of the B and B slash D soil groups. And I'll talk about those in a second, but these are some of the areas that this is what you'd be looking for is trying to determine where you are and what soil group is, is mapped in, in your area. Uh, you can get to those through the web soil survey provided by the U.S. Department of Agriculture very easily for handy, pretty quick online. If not, uh, again, a soil water district could probably help point you in the right direction. So as I mentioned, soil groups, there's four of them, A, B, C, and D. So it's real simple. A means, like it says here, very sandy soil likely is, is there, and you have very high infiltration rate works its way down and a B is a little bit more moderate inf infiltration because it has a little bit less coarse and more finer, more silty soils. C and D become problematic because they have low infiltration rates. C is usually because there's some sort of layer that impedes the downward movement of water and that can be good or bad. If we can break through that impeding layer then we've got great drainage. If not, we're probably in the D soil group and these are our clays and silty clays. Very tight soils, hold water as it says here, swell, keep, walk, keep a high water table, a clay pan, which is basically like clay turned to rock uh, or, or actually the presence of bedrock that keeps water from really infiltrating. And most of these areas have high runoff rates. And the last piece of information, and probably the most important, is really just to get your hands dirty on site and do a test. And you could, if you're not comfortable with this, contact a consultant. Your septic uh, system designer may be able to do this for you as a per test. You can also do your own. You can do it simply as in the lower picture by digging a hole 
filling it with water or by using a ring infiltrometer as shown there in the upper right. Real quick directions on that. Uh, I don't have a lot of time to go through it, but you're, you're basically filling that ring up with water and, and timing how quickly water drops in that ring. So how, how fast is my infiltration rate in the soil? And you see I dug down to place this ring about six inches or more than my rain garden um, surface will end up being. You'll do this many times and the soil needs to be wet so that you can get really what is a true infiltration rate. If any of you dump the water on soil like now uh, in the middle of June or July or August when it's bone dry outside, that water will just get sucked right in. If you dump it out there in March when things are kind of damp and wet and moist and saturated, it's not going to happen. So you'll time that out over several tests and you'll eventually see as this curve shows, it kind of flattens out. This is the same data set to uh, a rate of of uh, somewhere between zero to two inches probably per hour. In this case, you can see if I took my first test, I'd say, great, boy, I had six inches per hour. But if I take multiple tests, it, that curve actually flattened out to a real true rate of about more like a half inch per hour. And that's the, that's the rate that we're gonna probably see happen in a rain garden. Okay, so as I said, you know, you need this test should be done when the soil is relatively wet. So you may want to wet the soil ahead of time a few days to kind of move you along the process. You might want to do multiple test runs at different times or different places if your rain garden is going to be big and not just rely on one test. Okay, so now to the bread and butter of things here, how to design a rain garden. All these things come into play and are all related. Uh, so the real answer is there's no wrong answer. The most important thing is that what you design fits the planting uh, palette that you have with respect to how wet or dry it will be. So things like size depend upon your, the, plate, the space available, how big you want it. Bigger means probably more plants, more cost, more maintenance, but maybe more opportunity for larger plants or a more beautiful garden. The key again is to make sure that if our, our rain garden is too big or too small, it may be wetter or drier than we expect, and that could be detrimental to the plants. A lot of things to consider when siting it. Uh, you probably want to stay away from your foundation to prevent drainage problems or basement problems. Uh, things like septic fields, buried utilities, water wells, where do you have shade, not shade, those are all things you're going to consider that might be problematic when figuring out where to put the rain garden. So that brings us to really only two things to consider. One is the treatment level. So if we're doing no treatment, there's no point in a rain garden. If we want to treat everything, that's going to be problematic. And that's why I say, I, maybe that's for the how to build an arc uh, webinar. Be, because the reason for that is if we look at rainfall, and this is almost 50 years of rainfall data in the Dayton area, you can see that cumulatively, Almost all that rain comes in small events. Almost a quarter inch of rain makes up 720 total inches. As compared to a one inch event that makes up 250 total inches and a three inch event that's, that's almost 60 inches. So even though the big events of the, the, the really gully washers get all the attention, it's the small events that, that contribute most to the rainfall. So as I like to tell my daughter there, um, the theory is a little bit goes a long way. If I look locally here at Warren County, again, looking at the rainfall events, three, almost three to four tenths of uh, an inch of rain is about the median rain event. So what that's telling me is one, collecting a half inch to an inch of rain uh, can do a heck of a lot of good. I can collect nine, almost 90% of my, my uh, total rain throughout the year or the life of the rain garden, and that can really do a lot of good. So now I've thought about that, my, my last step is really going back to those soils. And what I want my rain garden to do is drain within 24 hours. So I'm gonna pond water and that can actually have some, a lot of, uh, besides storing runoff, it, it can have some visual effects that are, are pretty neat. But if it sits there, I may have mosquito problems, my plants might not survive, I may not wanna see a standing pool of water there for various reasons, although it'll be very shallow. So I wanna make sure I have soils that are gonna take in that water appropriately. There's a whole range of intake rates, as you can see that the chart on the left, all the way from almost nothing to four inches an hour. And 
a lot of the guidance you'll see, I want to point this out, may tell you you can do your own kind of field tests, like they're ribboning out soils there. And I'm not really good at that. That's hard to do if you're not an expert. What I recommend is following a, sort of a weight, weighted approach of considering all the things I mentioned, what soil group you're in, what your test rates come out from, and then determining if your soil fits which of these three classifications, sand, silts, or clays. If you're in the sandy range, the silty range, you're good to go. If you're in the clays, we'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, because what you probably need to do is amend those soils. And you can do that by just digging a little extra dirt out and, and adding, what I would do is add a, a compost topsoil mix um, to supplant some of that clay soil and, and really add that extra topsoil layer that's gonna be that sponge to hold water below the surface. I'm gonna, I'm coming on towards the end of my time here, so I'm gonna continue to move through this a little quickly, but depth will come into play based on your slope. So the slope of your yard, uh, and this really based, is based on just kind of evening out the cut and fill. As you dig a hole to build a rain garden, what are you gonna do with that dirt that you dig out of there? Are you going to build a little berm as shown here in the bottom picture? And, or are you going to have to get rid of that soil somehow? Ideally, we try and use it all so you don't have to, to, to find a source to get rid of that soil. And that's gonna take me to the question you all wanted to know, well, how do I design it? What do I do with all this information? And this is a really cool tool that I found that I would recommend to use. And the website is right here and, and you'll have a copy of this presentation. So don't, don't scribble it down, but it works relatively easily. And um, I was gonna show you, but I'm a little short on time here. So you can input all of the information I just discussed with you, the surface area of your roof, the number of downspouts or the dimensions, the sandy, silty clay soil that you came up with, uh, the slope that you have measured out, and how much rainfall you wanna collect in that little gauge up at the top. And in this case, I put one inch, as I said, that gets us plenty. And you can see for that example site, which had 900 square feet going to two downspouts, it's telling me a good size rain garden is 220 square feet with four inches of depth. I can't verify the planting number and cost uh, values, but it's probably a good place to start if you're if you're looking for those numbers. Shapes. Uh, it, it, so once you figured out 225 square feet, great. Now how do I do that? Well, that's that's where the the fun comes in, and I, we move out of the engineering discussion and into the 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 landscaping art uh, discussion, and that's to your preference. What I usually tell people: start with the basic shape, square, circle there, figure out the area, measure that out, lay it out where you intend the rain garden to be. You can stick with that as the picture shows a perfectly rectangular rain garden. It's just great. You could simplify that a little bit, make it more fun and put, put it to an oval or a teardrop shape simply by just using some basic geometry, lay it out. And then I do some kind of plus minus cut and fills as I draw the line, the oval over the square there. So it all balances out and we're still roughly at 225 square feet. Remember, it's not an exact science. So if we're short or plus a, a few square feet, that's not going to be a problem as long as our proportions are pretty close. Other thing I want to mention is now how do I get water in and out of my rain garden? Uh, things to think about are if I'm going to be piping it from a downspout, I probably need some sort of stone uh, to help dissipate that flow coming out of that pipe. You can see in the upper left, my, my first reaction in that photo was, hey, why don't they just, you can almost cover that you don't like that little pipe, six inch pipe sticking out there and it could be a crit or problem. Cover that with rock, water will still flow through it just fine. Uh, you may need a spreader down below that. They use some river rock to, to help move water throughout the rain garden so it doesn't just blow right through the center of it. Distributes it over the entire surface area. You may have to do a surface overflow so when we go above that one inch of rain, we get those gully washers, water's water go. We want it to safely pass out of your rain garden and where it would normally go. So, the upper right, they use a little bit of rock to create a little weir. Those are awfully tough to maintain because water is a very powerful force and that's gonna probably continue to erode if, again, it's not designed right and the water passes over. Safer way to do that is with pipe. So you could do both inlet and outlet. So this downspout comes directly into a rain garden. If your elevations work, you can make that a bubbler type inlet where the water just basically seeps up, shoots straight up out of that inlet. Or if it were flowing the other way, that 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 little grade is set at the top of your pool, your 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 rain garden depth, and water will then just flow into it and out the pipe to the to the street the, the same way it's going now. 
Okay, so a uh, quick run through of a lot of different thoughts. Uh, I just want to leave you with that. Rain gardens are something that can be very simple or very complex. But ultimately, you know, as we pointed out, um, anything can do a lot of good. So, so don't feel that because you're in a scenario where your soils are in the D soils and you've got heavy clays, I can't do it. Or I don't have a big space, I can't collect one inch of rain. It may be possible to collect a half inch of rain and still have a, a very good rain garden. You may need to use amendments to uh, have a very good rain garden. Studies indicate they do work very well when soils are right and they are kept up. It seems to be conclusive that, you know, that, that, that they, can, they can and do work. There's a lot of material out there, like I said, don't allow yourself to get confused by it. Uh, if you just Google rain gardens, you'll find probably page after page after page of guidance documents put together, including some locally that were done that might be a benefit. A lot of them are very old, some are new. They generally say the same thing, but in different ways. So if I didn't answer one of your questions, uh, you may find in some of that material, the actual answer. And again, it all really starts with, you know, before you get going on this project, do that assessment and, and think about, you know, where, where does your storm water go? And, and follow that path and that may get you thinking about if a rain garden is right for you or why you would want to do it or make you feel good about the rewards, rewards from it. So that's my son and I looking on a rainy day down the catch basin. And that's all I have, Melissa. I hope we're still on time, and uh, and, and uh, I'm sure we'll have some questions for maybe afterwards. Absolutely, yes. No, thank you so much, Justin. And yes, if any of you guys have questions over the material that we just discussed, please type that down in the chat box, and we will visit that at the end of our presentation. But for now, we are going to switch over to Cindy Meyer, our conservation specialist. So we'll let them get their screen switched over for us here. And at the end, we will go through any questions that you guys have in that chat box. Thank you, Justin. Yeah, thanks, Justin. I, I think that there were a lot of good points there. And um, I did want to mention that uh, you, you brought up the soil testing thing. And um, Warren County Soil and Water can help you with any of your soil testing questions. Um, so feel free to give us a call. And we do work with Michigan State and um, we do have soil tests for sale from 15 to 20 bucks and we do take credit cards so we'll send those out and you would go ahead and take your test um, take your samples and you would send those away um, but without further ado my section here this afternoon is really talking about plants for the rain garden and other maintenance considerations looking at you know the one to two to three plus year mark what are you going to have to do to make sure that this this rain garden um, still is still working for you so some of the discussion items that um, I'm gonna uh, cover today is just to have a goal in mind when you begin this um, we're going to talk about native plants we're going to talk about some plant requirements all those gardeners out there um, you may have heard this before but the this is really general information for any type of garden you'd be um, working with but it's really important information before you go and choose plants so we're going to look at hardiness size water requirements sun versus shade and plant some other planting tips we're going to look at plant zones. We're going to look at just a quick um, discussion on invasive plants. I'm going to give you my top five plants that I, I like. Um, we're going to look at the first, second year care, three plus years, what you can expect for care that way. And then we're going to talk about our photo contest and our grant program that we have available at Warren County Soil and Water Conservation District. So for me, truly, rain gardens are an, an exciting thing. It's not only a place where you can improve water quality, but it also can serve as a pollinator garden, which I'm pretty excited about, and a beautiful eye-catching area of the garden you can create um, by putting these in your landscapes. So everything from a wild looking patch to a more formal type of, um, of garden you can create. Um, so it's just doing double duty for you. It's, it's um, you know, cleaning your water as well. 
So again, having a goal in mind for your garden before you even put a shovel in the ground is important. Are you going to um, look at this as maybe being a wildlife site? Um, are you wanting to bring in, you know, animals to the garden? Um, something you might want to consider is leaving foliage on the garden over the winter to provide shelter and food for animals. Um, are you going to attract pollinators to the garden? And in that case, you're going to make sure that you want to choose a variety of plants with various bloom times and colors that last all season long. So from early spring to into the fall, um, what can you put in there to provide uh, a food source for those pollinators? You need a water source if you're looking at a pollinator garden. And then also, I always want to remind people you need to do your research for what types of plants are best. Um, for what you're trying to attract and make sure you have you know plenty of plenty of things to choose from there for those pollinators do you want a more formal feel like i mentioned earlier you would then choose maybe just a, several types of plants in one to three colors now like i said you know pollinators need various sources so that might not be as attractive to a pollinator um, as if you were you know uh, planning for that So native plants are something we always discuss when we look at rain gardens. Um, you know, any type of plant can go in here um, in these rain gardens, but you know, uh, native plants tend to be able to tough out, you know, the heavy rainfalls in the spring and then the droughts that come here in, in the late summer like we're going through right now. Um, in many cases, native plants are more attractive to bees, butterflies, and other pollinators. And that's because they have, you know, uh, better flowers for them to access. Um, native plants also tend to have deeper roots and so and that's compared to you know what we would normally use in the lawn. Deeper roots um, can survive those drought periods and can survive those downpours. But I do want to make mention that um, you can use herbaceous perennials, ornamental grasses, you can even use trees, shrubs, and vines in these gardens. It's really really to you. The one thing I would mention too is that you may not want to use annuals and bulbs. Those require a lot more maintenance and um, you know generally in these we want to keep it as the maintenance down as much as we can. Now it's not going to be maintenance free like most of us want but <laughs> it will it will um, cut down on maintenance if you if you keep if you don't use annuals and bulbs. Another thing I want to mention, you, and you probably already know this, hardiness. What is hardiness? Um, it refers to um, minimum winter temperatures. So here in south, um, southern Ohio, southwest Ohio, we're typically a zone six. So when you go into those um, stores and things and you're looking at plants, generally they'll have a tag there that says, you know, what zone we're in. And really zone six is usually that um, zero degrees to minus 10. That's the minimum temps that those plants can withstand. That, you know, and we've had colder temperatures. It doesn't mean that it can't, those plants can't withstand those temperatures, but on average, that's what those, those plants like. Um, you know, a few years ago, we did have really low temperatures and, but they weren't sustainable. So, you know, while we had really low temperatures, those plants didn't necessarily, some of them didn't get killed because that wasn't like three days of minus 15. Um, in Northern Ohio, um, in general, um, it's a zone five. And so that's, that is more of a 10 degrees to minus 20, um, what those plants can withstand. The other thing I wanted to mention is that you might have a microclimate. So it's really important that you know your property and know where you're putting this rain garden and what types of plants, you know, could, could withstand those temperatures. Microclimates, if it's in a really um, open area, it might, you know, the, the plants that generally would, um, you know, die at zero degrees, um, you know, may not survive because that, because that would be colder in that area. There's nothing to protect it. If the garden is closer and up against some trees and some other things, um, it might be a warmer area of the property. So explore that with the microclimates. Um, size and water requirements, um, something to take note of too. Uh, really, you wanna look at size of plants at maturity, not the size that you're buying 
them at. So, you know, if you're buying a one gallon potted plant and, you know, uh, three years down the road, it's going to be, you know, three feet tall and three feet wide. That's the size that you want to think about. Um, although you want to get larger plants for these types of plantings and, um, and not necessarily small plants um, to begin with, because you want to make sure that you are you you're getting that working that garden um, to work for you as soon as possible um, but you do want to make sure that you understand the size of maturity of that those plants will be water requirements are also important to take note of um, you know in the first one to two years of a rain garden's life the plants in it really need to be have a little more water than this one inch of water per week as you move into that three-year period um, one inch of water per week is the general guideline actually for every plant out there every tree every shrub um, and so when we get into these periods of four weeks with no rain um, you may want to go out and, and irrigate some of those plants if they're new plants, you especially want to try to help them along and, and irrigate if you can. So sun versus shade, this is always a, a interesting thing to discuss because, you know, what is a sun loving plant? You know, generally it's a six plus hours. You're going to put it in the area where it's going to have six plus hours of sun, of light. Shade loving plants then, you have various scales. And so light shade would be three to five hours of sun, partial two hours of direct sun. Full shade is less than one hour per day and dense, no direct sunlight reaches the ground. Good luck with full and dense shade. Um, I've had that question often throughout my career in extension as well as soil and water. And it really, really is um, hard to grow a lot of things in full and dense shade. So planting tips. Planting tips, um, just a couple things to take note of when you're digging those holes for those plants. You want to dig a hole that's large enough to fit the root system of the plant down in. You don't want to stuff those roots and fold them over. Um, you really want to make sure that there's a large enough hole for those roots. Um, you disturb that root system before planting. So I'll show you a picture here in a second of a root ball um, to help you understand that. But you wanna also make sure that that plant sits right at the same level as the surrounding soil. You don't want it too low and you don't want it too high. In the case that it would be too low, you might have a little more water that pulls there and create rot in, in that plant. If you would sit too high, you're gonna dry out that plant too quick. So it's not gonna get enough water, perhaps. So here's the root ball that I was talking about. And you know, sometimes when you pull a plant out of a, a out of a pot, it can be root bound. And it's really important to take a knife through here and you know, tease out the roots. I, you know, in general, just cut it. I've used, you know, a spade and cut, um, you know, three sides here to really make sure that those roots start to expand out and don't stay growing in a circular, in, in, a, in the pot form. So in a rain garden situation, um, you have three planting zones. And that zone one really is a zone where plants can tolerate that, that really wet condition. Zone two are um, for plants that can tolerate an occasional standing water and zone three are for plants that prefer drier conditions. So you want to take note of that. It's not to say that you need to plant something that's going to sit in water all the time and in fact I wouldn't choose plants like that for a rain garden situation. I would just choose plants that could you know have wet feet occasionally and tolerate that in zone in that zone one. We've all heard of invasive plants and invasive species for that matter. Emerald ash borer is the big one that I'm sure everyone has heard about. But invasive plants really um, are no good. It can outcompete native plants. Um, it does, it, you know, it creates a my or a uh, a mono uh, culture for you. Um, really do your research on some of this stuff. Uh, 
I begin to see some invasive plants pass around um, by gardeners and things. You know, they have beautiful flowers typically. That's typically why they've been brought in. And um, just beware and do your research. Um, one place to check out would be the Ohio Invasive Plants list, um, which I think is available on several sites. The one that I looked at was through Ohio Department of Agriculture. And you can see the list of, of species there that we would consider invasive. There are others out there, of course. Um, just a couple that I, I wanted to mention. Purple loosestrife is a, is a pretty big one that you see entire fields of. And then autumn olive also is, is one that's included on there. I do also want to mention too, you know, aggressiveness and invasive are two different things. Um, we can have aggressive plants that can take over a bed, but they may not be invasive species that, you know, um, expand out into the natural environment, into our native woodlands and, and things. So be aware of that. Um, I think we tend to use invasive uh, it's a little overused, um, in my opinion. Um, aggressive may be a better word, and I will uh, share one of my five um, top plants is somewhat aggressive, so be aware. Um, so we'll begin with that. Uh, one of my favorites, and this was planted in a rain garden that I was involved with a couple years back, um, was mountain mint. And Pacanthemum muticum is just a cool plant to see in a garden, um, in a rain garden situation. Lots of pollinators visit this plant, not just bees, um, just a whole variety. And it's a really cool thing. Um, I do also want to make sure you understand that this is not from the genus Mentha, which includes the mints that take over and are very aggressive, and in some cases invasive. But um, this is from the, uh, again, the genus is Picanthemum there, and um, it can reach um, heights of one to three feet. It can, it can expand out pretty, pretty well, three to four feet. And if you don't like it to, if you don't want it to expand that far, um, you could definitely cut the roots back in the spring. Um, but again, it's uh, not in the genus Mentha, but it does have a really nice mint mint smell. Um, a couple interesting facts is that Native Americans um, use this to treat fevers, cold, and stomach aches, although I wouldn't recommend that, but I like the history of plants, and so that was one of the things that I, I thought was interesting about this. The, the flowers are not really showy. Um, the bracts really um, kind of are the showy part of this plant. They're really silver, and so it brings in that silver color into the garden, which I, which I, I like. Another one of my top five is the cardinal flower. The cardinal flower likes sun to part shade. Um, it's really, it may not tolerate some of that wet feet, um, although it needs moist, moist areas. Um, birds, butterflies, hummingbirds really like this plant. Um, an interesting um, point about this, this plant is that it was used for love potions, although I wouldn't recommend um, because it, all parts of this plant are poisonous, so don't use it in your love potions. But anyway, um, again, it's a good nectar source and uh, really cool color in the garden. Another one of my top five is wild bergamot, and this is Monarda fistulosa. Um, it needs good drainage. Uh, it has, uh, uh, it likes uh, dry moist soil, sun to part shade. It attracts bees galore. Bumblebees love this and they really get on those flowers and shake them. Um, native bees are attracted to this. Also um, hummingbirds. It's just a great plant to have around. I will say that if you do not, if you're not able to get it in a location where it can kind of dry out, um, you may have mildew problems with this plant. But wild bergamot is a, is a really neat one to have there. Columbine, I put this in here because it really reminds me of my childhood and my grandmother's um, uh, gardens. Um, this is really a, a shade type plant and um, 
while Columbine likes part shade to shade situations, like I said, um, you can see hummingbirds on this galore. Um, I just love the leaf shape um, that it you know, that it brings into the garden. Um, but again, it likes a dry, moist um, soil situation and it's part of the buttercup fam family. And another really cool one um, to think about bringing into your rain garden is the cup plant. I like the cup plant um, for the fact of what you see here on the right hand side. Um, the leaves create a cup and water holds in there so it does double duty for you not only is it pretty um, it's a native and it brings in your water source there for your pollinators and other wildlife um, the birds are attracted to the seeds of this plant um, it has special value to native um, bees, bumblebees, honeybees. It actually provides nesting structures for your native bees as well because um, they need those open reeds. So I would suggest leaving, um, you know, the dead um, foliage in the garden over the winter so those bees can take advantage of that in the spring. This can be very aggressive. So make sure that you're keeping watch of this if you, if you put this in your garden but just another really cool one. It likes sun and the soil mo moisture has to be dry, moist, and wet. So first, second year care, again, mulching one to two inches at most. You wanna use a shredded hardwood mulch. Um, this is less likely to float versus a, a full hardwood mulch, not a shredded. And so that's what we suggest. You wanna monitor for rainfall. Like I said earlier, all plants need that one inch of water a week, although newer plants may need a little bit more. You need to do a, a finger test. And really, um, you know, the roots are not gonna be very, very deep at that point if they're new plants. So you want to make sure you you dig down a little bit and you know feel the soil moisture to make sure that there's moisture in the ground. Weeding is really important to keep weeds down at this point because your plants are not going to be large enough to really shade out those weeds. So really three to four times a year um, you can pretty much expect. You may be doing a little bit more of that, um, but three to four times um, during the year is is probably minimum. Three plus years, um, you can expect to do some plant division. As plants get older, they're going to get larger and you may see some melt in the middle, um, die out in the middle. And so that really um, tells me that it need those plants need divided. It's best to do that in the spring or fall and don't be afraid to get your shovel down in there, dig that plant out and take that spade and cut it in half or quarters. Um, you really want to make sure um, you get this done and, um, and put those plants down, you know, back in the ground pretty quickly. Weeding again, um, you know, as those plants get larger, you're going to have less weeds. They're going to shade them out. Mulching, again, each spring, um, no more than, again, it's more like a one to two. I put two to three inches. You won't want to go more than three inches in your garden. You want to keep the, that mulch away from the crowns of the plant, so the middle of the plant, because um, that can promote some, some um, rotting. Again, watering, check on the garden periodically. Three plus years. Um, again, you're going to clean out the debris if it inhibits the water path. So Justin had a really nice picture of a water garden, a side view and underneath. Um, I didn't find a, a, a really great picture here, but my cursor right where, you know, that water is going to come into the garden, you really want to make sure that that's cleaned out. Um, and really year one and two, you want to do this as well. Um, you don't want to inhibit that water's path in any way. So leaf debris, any plant debris, uh, make sure that that's, that's free and clear. So that really concludes that part. I want to open this up, though, um, you know, to the uh, couple things that's happening at Warren County Soil and Water. We do have a photo contest for Operation Rain Garden. Um, you can find all the contest rules online. Um, our contest dates are June 1st to July 30, or August 31st um, by 4.30 p.m. You would just submit a photo of your rain garden. Um, and it's 
you know, this would be really cool. We're going to try to put a virtual rain garden tour of Warren County together. And five winners will be randomly drawn from all entries to receive a $25 gift certificate for native plants to expand your rain garden. So that's pretty cool. Check it out online. And I also wanted to mention too that we have a garden grant, a rain garden grant program opening up today. And this is for municipalities and public park grounds. Um, we'll be accepting two applicate uh, We'll be funding two applications in 2020. Each accepted application will be eligible for up to 10,000 in reimbursement to design and install and for those plants for that rain garden. Again, these rain gardens should be on public land so that they can be used for educational opportunities in the future. But this is pretty exciting. We'd like to see over the course of time, you know, upwards of six to 10 of these gardens put in place. Um, but again, uh, again, we're accepting applications online at warrenswcd.com and the application period opens today and it will close on September 30th. Um, so if you know anybody who might be interested in this, um, forward this along to them um, and have them apply. You will be receiving a Rain Garden Resources um, slide here um, with these links. And uh, certainly if you have more questions for us, um, you can let us know. And again, that's it for me. All right, excellent. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. And thank you, Justin, again. If anybody does have any questions right now, if you want to enter them in the chat, we can ask Cindy and Justin while we have them here. Um, Justin, just so you know, when you had asked your, your question at the beginning of your presentation, we did have some responses that the wildflower field was the rain garden. So people, people were aware, which is great. <laughs> um, we are going, this presentation is being recorded. So you guys are going to receive a link of this full recording, as well as a follow-up evaluation. It's just a couple of questions. If you guys want to let us know how your webinar experience was today. Um, we do have a question, Cindy, um, asking where the monies to fund the Rain Garden Grant Program came from. And so actually, is Molly on? She might be able to comment on this. I am on, I'm here. <laughs> so we have various monies that have come into the district. Um, we do work uh, in all of the county or all of the um, jurisdictions in Warren County, uh, stormwater work. Um, we have some permitting fees that come in for our inspection and our management of construction sites. And then we get some monies from municipalities to carry out some stormwater permitting um, uh, programs that they have. And so we've used and pulled some of that money to give back to the communities and to put these, um, these rain gardens in public places so that the communities can um, enjoy, the people, the residents can enjoy these rain gardens as well. Excellent. And we are getting a lot of thank yous to you guys. So thank you again for this, this excellent presentation. Okay, well, I do not see any further questions coming in. So thank you everyone again. And please check out our website, uh, Operation Rain Garden for further information. And we hope you guys all have a wonderful day. Thank you, Melissa.